Good morning. Welcome to the April 3rd service, morning service here at First Christian Church of Atlanta. Glad everybody could get out that you weathered all the pollen on the way in, but don't worry because rain is on the way and it's just going to wash it all out so we can start over. To start our service this morning, if you would, stand as you were able and join the choir in singing 
hymn number 561, It Is Well With My Soul. Good morning. All right. So today I just want to take just a couple more minutes to talk about what is to be a be a Christian. So you know, I always like to ask questions, right? So I'm going to give it a couple more minutes to think about what is Christian? What does it mean to you? What does Christian do? Hmm. For instance, um, I know, Christian. So if anybody asks you, so, okay, I hear you go to church. Oh, that means you're a Christian. Logan and Tucker, what do they do? What does that mean? I might ask some adult, okay? So, okay, and I'll put it on the spotlight. So, would you like to think about it? Logan, do you think it means to do good unto others? Yeah. Yeah. What else do you think it might mean? Treat your neighbor like yeah. you would yourself? Yeah. Treat your neighbor like it's yourself. And also to help the poor. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And so some people say Christian, of course, most of adults will say Christian means a follower of whom? Yes, and Christ. Absolutely, that is correct. And, of course, you know what that means, following Christ. And when I looked it up, I learned something new the other day. You know, the Christian is a combination of two words from Greek words. And I would, would you mind? Yeah, would you mind? I, I don't have enough hands. Can you come up here, please? So, if you put Christ, and if you 
system right here and hold it up like this. So, can you see this words? What does it say? Rise. That means, um, in Greek word, anointed. Anointed means, you can stay right there. I got, yeah. So, means, you know, you put oil, kind of smear, rub on your head, on your, you know, forehead, you know, to be a priest, and then preacher, minister, like a Mr. Tom, the reverend, the minister, the delivering the gospel to the people, the God's words. Anyway, Christ means anointed. And then this T I A N means in Greek, a little ones. So we put together, we're going to hide the little T, like that, a little higher. Hold that like this. And then it says Christian. So little one, T I A means a little ones, and Christ, Christ means anointed one. So can you put them together in English words? And yes, me Christian meaning little anointed. Yes, little Christ is anointed means anointed. Little Christ, little Christians. So no matter how young, how small we are, we are Christians and follow our Christ. Okay, so I hope that and pray you will continue to do what Christians do, helping poor and being nice to your neighbors. Okay, thank you. Amen. Amen. I noticed that everybody was tuned in to that, right? And uh, it was nice having the visual with the two uh, spokes models up there to hold up the word. So good for you. Thank you. And as Christians, as followers of Christ, as believers, we also have this community of faith where we can come together every week and join in prayer and fellowship and song and in reading of Scripture. Now that we have this opportunity to pray, let us now bring to mind those thoughts, those words of praise and gratitude for the blessings we've received from God, but also words of care and concern for ourselves, for our families and our loved ones, for people throughout the world who are uh, dealing with all kinds of issues. We thank God that he has created this community, and no matter where we go in the world, we can break bread together with fellow believers. So even here at this moment, we are in a specific location, right? 30084 is our zip code. But we join together with believers all over the world in praying to a Heavenly Father. So that during this time, let us now go forward in our time of prayer. I invite you, it, uh, during the course of this prayer, when I say the words, hear us as we pray in the silence of our own hearts, that you will offer up to God your own words of praise and gratitude and care and concern. Let us now pray. O Lord, our God, bless us today through your Spirit that we may find certainty of heart and community under your care. May we keep this certainty whatever course our lives take, whatever battles and suffering may come to us. For we belong to you, and you guide us because we are your children. Watch over all who are still far away from you, but who long for you. Watch over all who are good-hearted and sincere, even if they often do not understand you. Protect them. And let your kingdom come so that your will is carried out. May the many who feel compelled to seek you and those who seek goodness and truth find you. Grant that we and many others serve you with our whole lives. And in this moment of gathered worship, hear us as we pray in the silence of our own hearts. And now let us join our hearts, our minds, and our voices in that prayer which we were taught to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We've now come to the time in our service where we give back a portion of what God has blessed us with. I have um, really happy to announce that very soon when we get to this portion of our service, the deacons will once again be passing the plate out in the congregation. Until then, we do have collection plates in the back of the sanctuary. You can also mail your uh, tithes and offerings in or go online. At this time, let us pray. Father, we thank you for all of your blessings. We thank you for the material blessings you have given us. We thank you for the time that you give us to gather here as believers. As we give a portion of what you have blessed us with back, Father, we ask that you would accept this gift. Help us to use it for the furtherance of your kingdom here on earth. In Christ's precious name, amen. Also looking into ways that we can resume something a little bit more of a normal uh, communion service. But in the meantime, until then, we will continue to use these uh, disposable ones uh, in terms of the COVID considerations. Is there anyone here who does not have one? Okay, good. Just to repeat something that's worth repeating as often as possible. The Lord's table is an open table. It is open to all who desire to partake of the Lord's Supper. We do not have any restriction or qualification for uh, partaking of the Lord's Supper. And here we are approaching Easter. How many Sundays until Easter? Two. Can you believe it? Next Sunday is Palm Sunday, and the Sunday after is Easter. It's just coming up so quickly. So as we meditate on the season of Lent, we think about all of the uh, things that lead up to it, we are reminded that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, one of the things he did is he was with his disciples in the upper room and they were having a meal and he assumed the role of a servant. And he wrapped a towel around himself I assume it was large like a beach towel, don't know. And he proceeded to wash their feet. But if we're reading through the scriptures, we'll realize that about four days earlier, Mary had washed Jesus' feet and had anointed them with expensive perfume. She performed this act of reverence to Jesus and called him Master. Four days later, Jesus is taking on this role of servant and washing his disciples' feet. And afterwards, he told them these words. Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, 
nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. His was an act of service for the ones that he now called friends. So which Jesus are we remembering here at this table? Our Master and Lord, or the one who became like a servant? I think the answer is both. At the table, we remember the one who showed God's love for us by giving his own life, by assuming the role of a servant, and also dying, giving up his body, his blood, and his own life. But we also remember our risen Lord, who is the master and host at our table. So as we come, let us remember the one who was both Lord and master, but also loving servant, and let us seek to follow in his footsteps. And now for the words of institution. For I have received of the Lord what I have also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the, club, the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, as we come once again to this table, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you also for the opportunity you have given us to serve alongside you. Please bless us Keep us ever mindful of our role in your kingdom. We ask all of these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. If you would join me now, let us open the top layer so that we may partake of the bread as we remember the body of our Lord Jesus. back the second layer. As you are able, let us partake of the cup. Remember the blood of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Our scripture today comes from the book of Philippians, chapter 3, verses 12 through 21. And the text reads, Not that I have already obtained this, or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own, because Jesus Christ has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us then who are mature be of the same mind. And if you think differently about anything, this too God will reveal to you. Only let us hold fast to what we have attained. Brothers and sisters, join in imitating me and observe those who live according to the example you have in us. For many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. I have often told you of them, and now I tell you, even with tears, their end is destruction, their God is the belly and their glory is in their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and it is from there that we are expecting a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
He will transform the body of our humiliation that it may be conformed to the body of his glory by the power that also enables him to make all things subject to himself. God bless the reading of his word. That medley took us back, didn't it? A lot of wonderful songs that we grew up singing, enjoying. Thank you, choir. It was very nice. So as I mentioned a few moments ago, next Sunday is 
Palm Sunday. Would you believe? And that means that two weeks from today, it is Easter Sunday. Hard to believe. I mean, I don't know about you. Maybe time is just crawling by, but for me, it's just whizzing by. Here I was just yesterday thinking, what would I preach about during the season of Lent? And what will we do on Easter? You know, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, next thing you know, it'll be Christmas. It's just, it just whizzes by so quickly. And, of course, this year, instead of following the usual themes of Lent, I uh, decided to kind of do a confirmation class. And you guys have been through uh, four of those so far, right? Can anybody name four, the, the, top, the first four? Uh, you know, the five-finger exercise, right? We're ready for five today. What's, what's one? Number one, the first one? I, I think I heard it, but faith, faith. When I heard faith and baptism together, it sounded like fascism, and I know that wasn't right. <laughs> well, at least I hope not. <laughs> yeah, so somebody said faith, somebody said baptism, so it was like coming together in my head. Faith? Okay, I'm going to start using visuals, I think. Okay, faith, the next one starts with an R. Repentance, that's right. It's hard to remember because none of us do it, right? Faith, repentance, confession, confession, yeah. And last week we talked about, starts with a B, baptism, there we go. Not fascism, but baptism, there you go. Faith, repentance, confession, baptism. And the fifth one is called living a Christian life. So that was our five-finger exercise. Um, So the first lesson was entitled Belief. I'm sorry, it was about faith. But remember, I decided to give the, the titles a little bit more meat and potatoes. So instead of calling it faith, we called it, it begins with belief. Because I think that's a very true statement, that our whole engagement with God must begin with belief. The word, words like faith and belief kind of are used interchangeably in our daily conversation a lot of times. We can say, I believe in you, or I have faith in you to another human being, and that's kind of meaning the same thing. Um, but it is important for us to distinguish between a passive belief and an active faith. And if the plan of salvation begins with belief, then we must recognize that what we are believing in is not simply a statement of fact. It's not like the you know, Pythagorean theorem, and, and I don't want to ask everybody, you know, what the, you know the Pythagorean theorem? You do? Okay, everybody's saying yes, but I'm not hearing A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Am I right? Did I get it wrong? I got it wrong. What is the Pythagorean theorem? Oh, I had it right. Oh, somebody's messing with me out there. I get it. I get it. Okay. So, we know the Pythagorean theorem, but we got to work on the five-finger exercise. Is that what you're saying? Okay. All right. It's time to get spiritual, everybody. I'm just being funny. So, we can learn things uh, that are statements of fact, and that's something that we can believe at sort of a passive level. But when we talk about faith in God, we're not really talking about a passive belief. We're not talking about a statement of fact or talking point. We are believing in or putting our faith in a person. And that person, of course, is Jesus Christ as Son of God, as Messiah. As we read a few weeks ago, let me read it again, Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That sounds a little bit more than just a passive acceptance of fact. It sounds like an act of the will to me. In the second lesson on repentance, I I gave it the title, It Inspires Us to Set Things Right. Repentance is more than just saying, I'm sorry. It is doing something about it. It means Working to end our bad patterns of behavior. Now, I say working to end because I know even because we, you know, go through faith, repentance, confession, baptism, is not to say that we are released from all of our problematic behaviors. It means that we are working 
towards them, and now we have the assistance of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Uh, if David Gere were here, I would, I would mention that David enjoyed reading my master's thesis, which was on the topic of repentance. And so I just I throw that out because David may be listening. He may be watching online. And one thing that I learned in, in my process of writing that thesis was that in the Hebrew language, there's a word that means to turn. You know, like you're going this way and then you turn, shuv. And then the word for repentance is to shuva, which is to make a noun out of the action of turning. So repentance in very simple language simply means to turn from sin. In the lesson on confession, I directed our attention to the more positive meaning of the word. Now, of course, when we confess, you know, a lot of times we're confessing something that we did that we're not proud of or something that we did that was wrong. And, of course, what does a prosecuting attorney try to do but get a confession out of uh, a defendant or so forth? And I hope I'm not abusing that language. Uh, but, but there's another kind of confession, not simply... I am admitting what I did wrong, but there's a positive kind of confession in which I state, this I truly believe. This is a firm conviction of my heart. And what do we confess in our relationship with God? I confess, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that Jesus is the Messiah. That is called the good confession. And one illustration I use to sort of undergird that is, uh, I, I didn't mention this, but there's a famous book called uh, uh, Doing Things with Words by J.L. Austin, and he talks about what is called a speech act. There are times when words are more than just Legos that come out of our mouth to get assembled in various shapes and forms. There are times when words come out of our mouths that have power and effect. For instance, when a minister stands in front of two people and says, I now pronounce you. Right? Because the state of Georgia recognizes me as an ordained minister, and if I say I now pronounce you, husband and wife, or you know, whatever combination of that, then that has legal authority. Now I typically downplay the legal authority, and I'll say by my authority invested in me, by the authority invested in me by God. And then I may throw the government in there later, you know. Because I think that Christian marriage is of a higher level than just a civil or civic marriage. Um, lost my spot. So I call this lesson, It Leads to a Confession of Faith. And a confession of faith, I believe, has power. It has meaning. It is a speech act that means more than just, here is a fact, two plus two equals four. It's not the same thing as saying, I believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Again, Romans 10, 9. Did we see that word in there again? If you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, that's not a passive statement of fact. Is it? That is an act of the will. That is a powerful statement of I truly believe. And then last week, the message was entitled, It Leads Us to Unite with Christ. And that was about baptism. Christian baptism is both symbolic and sacramental. And I hope that I did a, a good job of explaining the difference there. As a symbol, baptism represents the washing away of sin. We go into the water, we go under the water, we come out clean if if that's all it was, then you could take a shower every day and that would be adequate, right? Or you could dive into a swimming pool head first and go completely under. But it's not just that the water is magic. This is the symbolic side. But there is a sacramental side. And the word sacrament means the coming together of, of God and humans. God and humanity. Heaven and earth. Going down into the water is like being buried in a grave. Coming out of the water is like rising again. So what are we reenacting here? But the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And then we read in Acts 2.38, Peter said to them, 
Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus. I'm uh, sorry, re- uh, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Baptism is a sacrament in that through this act of obedience, we receive the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is something that many Protestant denominations do not acknowledge. This is something that gets overlooked. Peter very clearly says, forgiveness of sins and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Baptism may be symbolic, but it is also a sacrament. It is a place where humans and God meet in person. So let's put all those titles together with their uh, simple words, and let's see what we come up with. First of all, it begins with belief, which is faith. Second, it inspires us to set things right, repentance. Thirdly, it leads us to a confession of faith. Confession, of course. And fourthly, it leads us to unite with Christ, which is baptism. So today we reach the fifth lesson, which is, I guess the thumb, living a Christian life. And the theme for, or the title of this message is, it changes the way we live. It changes the way we live. You know, in a manner of speaking, we really have kind of an unbalanced formula here, right? It's kind of like a four to one ratio. I guess Kirk is here, so I've got all these math thoughts coming out of my head. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But um, four to one ratio, what I mean is steps one through four are kind of what we traditionally might call getting saved. You know, we don't use that language much anymore, do we? Have you ever heard people talk about getting saved, right? So they talk one through four, faith, repentance, confession, baptism. And then you have this other one. It's almost like, you know, leftover, living a Christian life. Well, the truth is salvation is not something that, that is set in one place in time. It is actually an ongoing process. But what, happen, what typically happens when a person confesses Christ as Lord? What typically happens when somebody comes down the aisle or when someone is baptized? What do people tell them now that you're a Christian? What do they tell them to do? Go to church every Sunday. Your life will change. Read your Bible every day. Pray every day. Give 10% of your income to church. And, sir? Welcome. That's a good answer. I like that. Welcome. Uh, But I don't know if I'm speaking to any of your experiences growing up. But have you ever uh, heard people say, oh, now that you're a Christian, are you reading your Bible every day? Are you... Uh, praying every day, and and all of those things are Christian practices. All those things are good for devotion. But when we put it that way, it sounds like a checklist, doesn't it? It's almost like, you know, did you do the laundry today? Did you tie your shoes when you put when you put them on? Did you know? And so, what I'm wanting to be careful of is creating this sense, this feeling, that somehow it's all about keeping a checklist. It's all about this sort of perfunctory behavior. To me, it's kind of like sounds like a pyramid scheme. You know, like somebody says, okay, go through all these steps to become one of us, use the products at home, and then go out and recruit more people. Doesn't it? Okay. So I hope I'm not sounding too crazy here, right? Okay. Compared to the way we described the, the first four steps um, as an act of the will, you know, faith is an act of the will, and repentance as making a change in the way we live our lives, and confession is a powerful statement of what we truly believe about Jesus as Lord and Savior and Messiah. And as baptism, a a cleansing of sin, and baptism as receiving the Holy Spirit and all that kind of stuff, do we just follow all that with read your Bible every day, make sure you pray, make sure you give, is that all there is to it? That's my question. Sounds a little anticlimactic to me. And I'm wondering if maybe living a Christian life should be as dramatic and as life-changing as the faith, the repentance, the confession, and the baptism. Well, 
If anybody had the read your Bible every day and pray every day routine down, it was probably Paul before he met Jesus. If we go back to Philippians 3, the passage that uh, Tim read for us today, and we back up to verses 4 and through 6, we see what he was like before he met Jesus. He says the following, If anyone else had reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. And I underline that last line because Paul is saying, I checked all the boxes, right? I got them all down. I, as to the law, blameless. That, that is a pretty bold statement. Because many of us, when we look at all those commandments, and we're thinking, my goodness, I don't think I can keep all of those. And then you read the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says, you heard, don't murder, I'm telling you, don't even get angry. You know, and then we're thinking, how in the world do we live up to these standards? But Paul, in his pre-Jesus life, was feeling pretty confident that he had done that. So Paul kind of had the read your Bible and pray every day routine down. And by his own words, he describes his religious life as observant and blameless according to the law. And we must be careful that we don't misunderstand what he wrote here. Because he's not saying that all of that was wrong. That's important, because sometimes people read this and think, ah, he's saying that was all wrong. He's not saying that was all wrong. What he's saying, if you look at the words, he's saying that I found something better, something more meaningful. So let us read on, verses 7 through 11. He says, yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. We keep bumping into these words, don't we? Faith and belief and so forth. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death if somehow I may attain the resurrection of the dead. The something more that Paul had discovered was a relationship with Jesus Christ. And there's no reason to think that he gave up praying, right? There's no reason to believe that he gave up reading the Scripture. There's no reason to think that he gave up uh, any of those practices of righteousness before. It simply means that he knew that they had an object, that they were directed towards a person, knowing Christ. So think of it this way. This is the analogy that I try to come up with. Uh, and maybe this is better for the ladies, I don't know, but you can read a romance novel or you can fall in love with a real person. Which one has surpassing value? The truth is you can do both. You can read romance novels and you can have a, a romantic, loving relationship with a real human being. I'm not saying that they're, they're exclusive, but I do mean to say that one is probably of a higher value than the other. I'm just guessing, right? So this is more than a metaphor, because if we look at what Paul wrote, notice the intimate terms that he uses to describe his relationship with Jesus. So as an example, verse 8, for his sake I have suffered the loss of all things. He didn't say for the sake of following a code, I have suffered the loss of all things. I have, for his sake I have suffered the loss of all things. Secondly, and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, but one that comes through faith in Christ. Every statement he makes is connected to Jesus. You notice that? I want to know Christ. I want to know the power of his resurrection and sharing in his suffering. This is exactly what Anne was saying with the word Christian. It means a little Christ. We follow him. 
We imitate him, and that's what the word Christian means. We are doing our best, like Paul, to know Christ and to follow in his footsteps. So let's continue on. Let's read a, read a little bit more of Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 16. He writes, Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. You hear that relationship in there? Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who then who are mature be of the same mind, and if you think differently about anything, this too God will reveal to you. Only let us hold fast to what we have attained. See, there is yet more indication in this passage as we read on of this relationship that has been created between Paul and Christ, which I'm saying that we as believers can have that same relationship with Christ. Verses 13 through point. Verses 13 through 14 point us towards that ongoing nature of salvation. Not that it happened on a certain day at a certain time, but it began on a certain day at a certain time. As we read on, Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. As I mentioned earlier, salvation is not past tense. It's present tense, it's future tense. And then he wrote a little bit more, so if you'll allow me to just follow up with two more verses from today's text, verses 20 and 21. He says, But our citizenship is in heaven, and it is from there that we are expecting a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humiliation, that it may be conformed to the body of his glory by the power that also enables him to make all things subject to himself. So there is still this future tense element to salvation, the sense of it being completed, not in this life, but in the life to come, completed by Christ himself. It is not completed just because of our faith, our confession, our repentance, our baptism, or even our living Christian life. Paul writes that it is completed by Christ himself. I think that makes a big difference. He wrote that Christ will transform our earthly bodies, what he refers to as our body of humiliation, to be conformed to the body of his glory. We don't even know what that means yet, do we? So as obvious as it may seem to say, salvation begins and ends with Christ, that is exactly what we're saying today. He is the object of our faith, He is the one who calls us to repentance. He is the one that we confess as Lord, as Son of God, as Savior. It is in His name that we are baptized and in His name in which we receive the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And when we talk about living a Christian life, and while it does include reading the Bible, it does include praying, it does include all the other acts of worship and service that we do, we don't do it in order to earn you know, a badge. We do it in order to continue to grow in that relationship with Him. After all, why read the Bible if not to learn more about Jesus? How do we end our prayers, by the way? When we pray, how do we, what do we say at the end? In Jesus' name, right? Always ask in His name. There's a kind of joke, and I assume that many of you have heard this. Many people would say that when I got saved, I went down the aisle in order to get some fire insurance. Have you ever heard that? No? None of you have ever heard that? Well, good for you. Nobody's ever heard that. I'm I'm glad to know that. I've heard it. I've heard it from a lot of people. They were a child, they were in church, somebody was preaching about hell, they were talking about, if you don't get saved, you're going to go to hell, and you're going to burn, all this kind of stuff. And so they were afraid, and they came down the aisle, and they got saved. Well, 
I'm glad that many of you have not heard that because I just think that's the wrong approach. You know, uh, there was a preacher who back in the 70s had a very famous sermon about, you know, I think it was about Hitler and I don't remember who else, three really bad guys, you know. And he said, you know, in that sermon that if they all had a tour of hell, they would have done things different. And so I thought, okay, so what you're trying to do is trying to scare people out of going to hell, or as pardon the expression, they're trying to scare the hell out of people. Right? But I thought to myself, why wouldn't the opposite be true? Why wouldn't a vision of heaven be enough to change us? Why wouldn't that relationship with God be enough to change us? at least to motivate us in the right direction. Doesn't the prospect of a close and loving relationship with God have more appeal? Wouldn't you like to be able to say with Paul, all of my accomplishments and the things that made me feel proud have now taken a back seat to my greater interest, which is getting closer to Jesus. I think this is the meaning of living a Christian life. And it is a positive way of saying that it changes the way we live. She's coming. Anne's playing double duty today. She'll be right in. Our closing hymn today is number 560, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. You will sing the first and the last. I'd like to invite you to stand as you are able. I'd like to encourage anyone who wants to know Christ and the fullness of his resurrection. We make that great confession. Do I, do I need to start over? Well, okay. So we're still taking uh, donations to the uh, UNICEF project for children and who are evacuating the Ukraine. You can send a check to the church. You can just designate it for that. Or you can also give online and in the box mention, you know, Ukraine or whatever. Next one, please. I'm very excited. A month from today, we will have our first tutoring session. This is going to be a wonderful community outreach, and it's going to be a great service for children in our community who are struggling with math, and we're so grateful for this opportunity to serve.
probably why I went a little overboard in the math metaphors today, because I just, it's on my mind, and I want to promote it. I want people to be happy about it, and it's going to be wonderful. So I'm very excited about that. Next slide, please. Uh, same day, May the 1st, we're going to have our next youth committee meeting. We have so much to do to get ready for Tucker Day, which is going to be on May the 7th, so that same week. And it's going to be our wonderful outreach. We're going to, you know, we had such great results from last year's Tucker Day that uh, we just believe it's like a snowball and it's rolling down that hill and it's picking up steam as it goes and picking up snow also, by the way. Next slide, please. So there's our Tucker Day uh, announcement. Next one, please. And you'll see in the back three different flyers. Here's two examples. And could I ask some of you to please help me out on this? Um, we really need to get the word out for all these activities. We've got a Easter egg hunt in two Sundays, on Easter Sunday, following worship. We would love to have some guests come with children and show them the downstairs area where they have to go and hunt for Easter eggs. And then, of course, the tutoring on May the 1st, Tucker Day on May the 7th, and then, of course, our, our fine arts camp in June. This is just our uh, one after another activity aimed at children with um, families with children and so forth. But we have those flyers, and um, if, if you guys know of some place where you can put some down or if you can tape one or pin one to a bulletin board, would you please do that for us? Um, I'm running out of man hours here, and I'm, we're doing as much as we can, but the more we can get that word out, that would be wonderful. We also have electronic forms, and, and uh, we're going to have those posted on Facebook. If you can share, if you can distribute in various ways, uh, that would be so wonderful, and we appreciate it very much. Is there another slide after this one? Okay, that's it. All right. Pray. Yes, sir. They are. <laughs> and I have to say one more thing. Jill Chu and I had a thought this earth. We both decided that the grape juice tastes better, too. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, now we're all very spiritual. It's like a grape knee high. It's, it's, it's not like the other stuff. Yeah. Okay. Any other deep spiritual observations, by the way? Yeah. Uh, so what we think we're going to do, we're going to have the uh, deacons in a week or two start bringing the plates by for offering again. But we're thinking we might have the elders who with gloves and masks on maybe hand each person a, a cup or a piece of bread, something to make it a little bit more interactive, but still careful about COVID and so forth. We'll do what we can. Uh, and of course, we'll still have the disposable ones available for anyone who, who prefers that. Any other announcements? Hope that your life has been blessed today because you are with God's people, you were in God's presence, and you had the opportunity to sing and pray and worship and, and hear from the Word. Let us end with our benediction, which is also a prayer. O God, King Eternal, whose light divides the day from the night and turns the shadow of death into the morning, drive far from us all wrong desires, incline our hearts to keep your law, and guide our feet into the way of peace, that having done your will with cheerfulness during the day, we may, when night comes, rejoice and give you thanks through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.